ಶ್ರೀ ಗಣೇಶಾಯ ನಮಃ ಓಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಸದಾಶಿವ ಸಮಾರಂಭಾ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಮಧ್ಯಮ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರ very nice to see all of you i know it's been a while um one of the reasons is i ended up in the hospital again <laughs> uh, i keep getting this fever you know um and it uh, tends to creep up really high and the instructions that have been given is to go to the urgent care immediately so that's what i've been doing although it doesn't affect me <laughs> it affects the body <laughs> i don't know if you understand what i mean but so the body has to be taken care of so therefore you end up in a hospital and um they run all kinds of tests a uh, dozen different kinds of tests and they cannot figure out the reason why so the fever lasts a day they put me on antibiotics an iv and um uh you know then the next day i'm usually okay and i'm sitting and listening to vedanta and doing my own thing uh, i can't move much because i'm hooked on to this uh this you know this iv right so and it is also plugged in because it it uh, it has to be plugged in i guess so so i cannot move as much but i i'd be sitting in my bed there's a t- table they give you a table right that pulls over your bed so i keep my stuff uh, i make sure i take my stuff with me my vedanta stuff or my sanskrit stuff or whatever that i'm working on and i start doing my thing you know so and then uh, they keep me for a couple more days and then they send me home without finding the cause sometimes with antibiotics sometimes without it because last time they didn't even feel the need to give me Uh, antibiotics she just sent me home <laughs> so i come home and i feel fine for a week or two and then this thing repeats but hopefully this time um because this last time i had a fever i did i decided not to go to the, the hospital i just stayed home. <laughs> i did a, i did a <laughs> naughty thing and i stayed home but uh, luckily the next day the fever had come down and so i was uh, you know somehow lucky that way i suppose <laughs> lucked out mm, but anyway uh, uh, and also the t- temperature did not go up you know like freakishly high that like it usually does so that was another reason that is and also it was already in the middle of the night then i thought i'll just you know somehow um, you know suffer through it through the night and then in the morning i'll make a decision based on how i was feeling so i don't know if it was a, a rational thinking <laughs> or not but i somehow chose to do that and i i did okay so today's topic this wasn't the, this is not the topic uh, i just felt like sharing it um today's topic is uh, freedom from the perspective of vedanta so let's look at what is not the freedom from the perspective of vedanta so before coming to that you know before coming to vedantic freedom let's look at uh, what kind of freedom that we look for you know so we look for financial freedom within the family itself you know with we look for financial freedom um if you are uh, uh, you know from a, a country like india where uh, patriarchy is uh you know is practiced still in, in, in a major part of india but uh, it is changing it is starting to change in the cities and all of that it is not practiced like that anymore but now uh, in patriarchy is um, practiced the lady of the house doesn't have uh, any kind of even if the family is rich she wouldn't have financial freedom she she you know she, she wouldn't have the um the freedom to decide how much money to spend or just to go out and spend some money you know she cannot do that she has to have her husband by her side and he would make all the decisions for her that is a 
that's how it is uh, it used to be anyway and it is still in most part of the part of india and uh, so that kind of a freedom you seek you know some some women may seek that a lot of the, it works because the women are okay with it <laughs> they're totally okay with it they just depend on their uh, husband you know for all the decisions to be made any kind of decision and then they just depend on him to make that decision uh, uh, the reason is uh, they are trained that way right from the beginning um, and that the parents teach them to to depend on a man you know so while they're growing up they depend on their father and then uh, when they get a little bit older they depend on their brothers if they're not married yet and if they get married then of course they're going to depend on their husbands and they make all the choices and they, these women are okay with it they they have the attitude of uh, service you know that they serve and serve and serve and serve and without expecting anything in return so uh when it comes to bhakti uh such a woman is taken as an example you know the bhakti in bhakti main thing is surrender so when you surrender yourself completely it is uh, uh compared to a, a woman such a woman who was brought up in india who is uh, brought up with the attitude of service you know that as that woman is taken as an example to that extent it is uh it is valuable i mean if, if the lady, the woman is not suffering then what is the problem right and so you'd look at it it's it's each person's point of view at the, at the end of the day so she does it as a as a, as a service you know she completely surrenders herself to her, her husband and her husband's family so uh, from from the moment that she gets married and she wouldn't have even met her husband before marriage it's usually arranged marriages right so she she would meet him um on the day of the marriage and then she meets his family that same day but she leaves her own family and she surrenders everything everything she that is known to her is surrendered completely and she and the and she goes and lives uh, a brand new life in a brand new place in a brand new family you know so this is uh this is how when when it comes to surrender to bhagwan this may be something that is useful to keep in mind but then there are women today in india they are they are seeking this this freedom and a lot of them have it too you know so that may be a freedom that we may seek even otherwise you know in, uh, even if it's not a patriarchal society um sometimes one of the ones one spouse either of them it could be either the woman or the man one of them could be more dominating and may have all the decision making power when it comes to uh, the finances so then the the other uh, person may feel that that they need the financial freedom so that's something that we seek right something that we may seek and something that we understand um another kind of freedom would be uh political freedom right freedom to choose our leaders that kind of a uh, freedom we seek freedom of speech we may seek so i would like to express my mind you know what no matter what it is i would like to say it and express it and then people may or may not agree with me but you know i, I have the freedom to uh say or to speak right and i may seek that if i don't have it i'll seek that so these kinds of all of these kinds of freedom we may seek um and we may achieve that also we may right or we may not but on a daily basis five about making the ends meet that kind of freedom also we say that's one probably the most important freedom you know <laughs> something that uh, we probably all all of us probably seek so uh but then when it comes to vedanta what does this freedom mean what does it mean that's what we're going to analyze today suppose uh there are some uh, you know let's talk about these prisoners you know <laughs> some prisoners 
and uh, they have really small cells and they're uh, the 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 ground the playground they have or the ground that, that they may have to do their exercises or walking or some play some sports um, that may be really uh, small as well right so then uh, what would they seek they would ask for a bigger cell <laughs> a bigger womb, you know, in each cell should be a little bit bigger, and then their yard a little bit bigger also, they may seek, right? And if, suppose they get it, they get it. That is, is that, is that the freedom that we are looking for? Actually, yeah, <laughs> all the freedom that I just mentioned is something similar to this kind of a freedom. So, so the, the bondage is still there, but within the limits, we are looking for a little bit more room. But that doesn't, you still don't, at the end of the day, you still don't feel completely free. You know, no matter how much uh, we achieve this freedom and all that, we still come far short when it comes to that feeling, that bhavana, that bhava, you know, feeling free that we don't uh, experience. So what is that freedom? In the Vedantic perspective, what is that freedom? So we, we will keep on seeking freedom until we feel full and complete, right? Isn't that what it is? Suppose uh, uh, if I'm, I have to be lacking something, that's when I go seek it, right? If I, if I feel bound somehow, that's when I'm, I'm seeking this freedom. But there is this one uh, freedom achieving which all the other freedoms are achieved at that one, one moment. It is all simultaneously, simultaneously you accomplish all of the other freedom. So that is the ultimate freedom. That is called moksha, liberation. Okay. And where is this freedom? So when I look for financial freedom, um, I don't have the money in my hand. I don't have it in the bank yet, right? So I have to go out, I have to work hard and get paid. Then I have to acquire this wealth. When I have acquired this wealth, I put it in my bank. Now it is in my possession. Now I, you know, I may feel free. Do I feel free though? <laughs> or, or who is to say how much money is going to give me that freedom? It's a, it's a tricky thing, this money thing, you know. No matter how much money you have, you will feel like doubling it. Uh, and then you will get the freedom. You know? that, that you'll never feel free. Financial freedom is something that we never experience. Especially those people who are millionaires and billionaires. They do not have financial freedom. Actually, they are more poor than us because they're, when, if they're trying to double their millions, how much poorer they are than us. They're poorer by millions of dollars, right? <laughs> we may be lacking, suppose I have $10,000 in my bank and I'm trying to double it. I'm poor by only $10,000, but a millionaire is uh, poor by millions. Who's uh, poorer, myself or this millionaire? So, so the more money you have, the more money you lack because you're always trying to double it. You, you just, it, you know, that freedom never comes. That kind of freedom we never acquire. So it's tricky that way. You know, it's the same thing goes for material uh, things also. No matter what I buy, you know, the most expensive thing I buy, there's always something else which is twice as expensive and the neighbor might own it. And that's not good. I have to have it too. <laughs> so that kind of freedom is also very, very difficult to achieve. So we'll, we keep on working at it. Until when? I mean, you know, there's no uh, limit of time. We keep working and working and working and not accomplish that. So all the diff all the kind, all the kinds of freedom that I mentioned about. All of them we um, achieve by going out into the world and then grabbing it. Grabbing means somehow acquiring it. 
That's how I achieve. Uh, that's how I get these uh, accumulate all of this stuff, right? But then this freedom, Vedantic freedom, you don't go out into the world and uh, and and acquire it brand new. Okay, everything else you don't have it to begin with, and then you go and acquire it. Now you have it, right? But Vedantic freedom is something that is yours to begin with. This is the funny part. <laughs> See, those things that are closest to us are the things that are missed the most. You miss them. You, you really don't uh, see them. That's what happens. You see? So where do you hide your wealth? Where do you hide it? You have to hide it. If you hide it under the pillow of, your, uh, of the thief, for instance, he'll never find it because the pillow is closest to him. <laughs> He's not going to look under it. <laughs> you see, you go put it in your thieves uh, under the pillow or in his house somewhere. You hide it. You'll never be able to find it. You look everywhere. You keep looking for it, but you'll never find it. Similarly, this, the biggest wealth, which is my freedom, is with me. And I don't look there. I never look the last place I look. This is the problem, <laughs> you know? So um, what do we do? How do we uh, access this? It is actually, once you make a decision to access it, it is the easiest thing to acquire because it is already yours to begin with. There's no need to go out there and uh, and work for it. There's no need to work for it. Um, what, but whatever work you put into uh, acquiring this freedom, which is yours to begin with, will not feel like work at all. It, because I'm going to say, I'm going to use the word sadhana. Whatever, that is the work you put in to uncover this wealth, which is within you. Okay. So suppose there is a big uh, box with uh, a lot of treasure in it, but it is uh, buried. It is at the bed of a river. I mean, a pond. It's the bed of that pond. Okay, and the the water of the pond is very murky, and um, it is also turbulent. So it has. It's not calm. It is moving. Then, uh, then will you be able to see this box of treasures in it? You will not be able to see it, right? Because the water is really dirty and it is also moving. You will not be able to see it. So what you need to do is make sure that this, uh, no, not, the water is not disturbed. You just leave it undisturbed for a while, right? So it, it's just completely now uh, calming down. It's come, calming down and calming down and it becomes still. There's not even a breeze to disturb it. It becomes still. What happens is all the dirt settles down at the bottom and it stops moving and it is now a placid, placid lake. Now if you look, you'll be able to see the box very clearly at the bottom of, the, bottom of that uh, lake, right? So you can easily access it. Now all you have to do is dive in and pick it up and it is all yours to keep. So this is how you acquire that uh, freedom of the wealth of freedom within you. So uh, what is this uh, comparison? So there's murky water, right? That is the mm, mind. The mind is like the murky water and it is also turbulent. It is not calm. So you're not able to see the treasure buried within and the treasure is the source, very source of this uh, mind. The source of the mind is the treasure. So then you're not able to see because of this turbulence and also the turbidity. So how do you remove that? And all the sadhana that I was talking about, I mean the sadhana that I mentioned, all the sadhanas, that will help calm the mind down, it will also purify it, purify the mind. And then you can access the treasure within, which is the source of everything, which is the self. 
Self is this, the way that the real self within is the source of that uh, mind. So the mind is what is keeping you from enjoying that freedom. Okay. And the same mind is the one that will allow you to enjoy the freedom. Same mind. Okay. So uh, a mind which is not calm is the one that is keeping you from accessing this accessing this uh, freedom. And, and, this, and a mind which is calm which is pure, is the same, you know, which is the same mind, right? That mind will, uh, will let you uh, access it. That's it. It's very simple. It's as simple as that. So the culprit is the mind. That's it. You have to watch the mind. And all the sadhanas that we do is uh, aimed towards making this mind, first of all, clean and then quiet. Okay, so there is something called Vedantic religion or true religion. Um, this religion, uh, when practiced, that will uh, purify the mind and it will also make it completely quiet. And uh, so uh, how do you practice that religion? It's called the true religion. It, just, it doesn't have any borders. It is, anybody can practice it. And um, what is what is promised at the end of the day? Because when it comes to religion, there are certain religious practices, right? Always it's like that in religion. There's a set of religious practices, and there's always a, a, a fruit fruit of that result, which is promised, which is going to a heaven or something like that, right? Heaven is uh, described in many different ways. Everybody has their own idea of heaven in their minds, and so in order to gain that. Uh, heaven, a certain set of religious practices are followed, and then uh, and then uh, this uh, something has to intervene. This inauspicious thing called death has to intervene. Then it can be accessed. That's it. That's how it is practiced, right? Religion around the world. But uh, this religion is not like that. And this religion is um, you. Uh, start living a very simple life. When you go out for a walk, for instance, um, if you see some dry leaves, uh, don't stamp on them. Don't stamp on them. Why? Because when you stamp on a dry leaf, the dry leaf is dead. It doesn't have any life in it. Therefore, we think it's okay to stamp on it, right? But in a, in a Vedantic religion, you wouldn't do that because you won't commit, you think that it is a violence against that dry leaf. You have compassion even for a dry leaf. This is the subtle, subtlety of uh, uh, the sensitivity that I'm talking about. Subtle, very, very subtle sun sensitivity. So you're so sensitive that you won't even hurt a dry leaf. That is one reason. One reason is not to even hurt a dry leaf, right? But then again, the, the another reason is there may be a little creature hiding underneath it to protect itself from the cold or the heat or whatever, you know, there may be a little creature underneath it. So by not step, by choosing not to step on a dry leaf, what you're doing is you're not hurting anything. You're not hurting that little creature, which may be hiding underneath it, right? So that this, now you look, now you look at the mind. A mind which appreciates that, oh my God, what a, what, a, what a thought it is. What an amazing thought it is. Not to be uh, violent. Even that little violence that you show against a dry leaf, even that needs to be gotten rid of from the mind. Now think about that mind. How pure it would, would it be? Would it be pure? I used to do that. I used to like uh, stepping on the leaf when I went for a walk, the dry leaf. I used to look forward to the fall because I, could, I can step on that leaf and it'll make a a cracking sound, right? A crickling sound. And I used to enjoy listening to that. You know, I used to enjoy that. And then when I heard Swamiji say that I was in San Francisco and Swamiji was teaching a course there. And in one of the classes, he mentioned uh, even, even that is a slight, you know, a simple, small violence against that we commit against a dry leaf, right? Isn't it? You have to be able to stomp on something. It is, it's a little bit of anger, maybe a little bit of frustration, maybe a little tiny bit of 
violence. It crushed something. A leaf is there, a uh, dry leaf is there, and it has its own beauty. If you look at it, and we are able to, uh, if you are able to enjoy that kind of beauty. Sometimes we decorate our homes with dry leaves, right? In, in fall, because they, they're different colors and all that. And so we do appreciate that beauty in that dry leaf. So why crush it? Why take that beauty away by crushing it underneath your feet, you know? So ever since Swamiji mentioned that, I have not stepped on a single dry leaf consciously. Without, you know, unconsciously, it means uh, without paying attention if I were walking and talking to somebody or something. I may have stepped on a leaf or two, but consciously, no. I always skirt around them. Okay. So then then when you observe your mind, you'd see that it has become a, that much more pure, a little bit more, you know. So that's how you purify the mind. That is one example. Another example is sometimes when you walk, there may be a, a plant which would have grown into the sidewalk like this, you know, and it would be obstructing your way. Normally what we would do is we would just push it aside out of our way and then just walk on, right? But uh, when you practice Vedantic religion, what you would do is you wouldn't disturb it. You wouldn't even touch it. You would skirt around it. That's that's the kind of uh, religion I'm talking about. So this is a different kind of religious practice, isn't it? So anything you do, any action you perform, you see if there is even the slightest bit of frustration or violence involved in it. If it if it is, then you remove it from there. You know, the moment you come become aware of it, you would have gotten rid of it. You will never do it again. And uh, it, it, we need to observe that right from the you know moment we wake up in the morning, up until the moment we go to sleep, we observe our activities and see if there is a bit of violence in any of them. Even the slightest bit of violence or, or frustration, even frustration, the feeling of frustration. All of these feelings in the mind are the, what makes this, makes it turbulent, you know? These uh, different emotions that we feel, it makes it turbulent. And also the attitude we have towards the things that we do and we, the things that we come uh, in contact with. That is, that is the impurity of the mind, you see? So we need to remove both of those. So every action we pay attention to. Okay, and then when we look at something, when we look at an object, um, we usually find it as other than myself, right? This object is something that I'm looking at and I'm the person looking at it. So I, here I am and here's the object that I'm looking at. So it is other than me. It's all that's how we look at it. But when we practice Vedantic meditation, I mean Vedantic uh, religion, we don't do that. We don't look at objects as something that is other than me, right? Instead, I'm going to look at it in such a way that it is not other than me. It is one with me. So how how to do that? How do you look at that in such a way? that it is not other than me, that it is one with me. So suppose I'm looking at a tree. So I, I, the moment I name it as the tree, then it has become the other and I am the other. So there is a division between this myself and the thing that I look at. So I, I drop the name tree, right? And I drop the name uh, branches or the branches. I drop the names, name leaves. All of these names I drop. I drop all of that. And I just look at it at the present moment. So I'm not naming it with any of these things. So, you know, I'm not looking at the leaves. I'm not looking at the branch. I'm not looking at a tree. There may be other things in it also, like fruits or flowers. I'm not looking at any of that. I'm completely, I'm taking all the names out of it. When you take the names out, what happens is you're also not focusing on the form anymore. So the Nama Rupa, names and form is now gone. What you're looking at is what is. That is what it is, right? And look at yourself. You are, look, look at yourself as I am. I am. What is? Is there a difference between the two? 
Only only the language makes a difference. Suppose suppose I say I is, and that is, you know, the whatever I'm looking at. Suppose I say is and is, right? Suppose I say that, then there is no difference between the two. Isness, isness. <laughs> this is a Vedantic term. <laughs> isness means the existence, the very existence, existence absolute, my existence. And the existence of that, this, this thing that I'm looking at, right? Is there a difference between the two? There's no difference between the two. It's one and the same existence. Same existence principle that is making this exist as well as that exist. So you drop all, everything that, can, that divides that what you're looking at from you. And you look at it in such a way in the present moment as what it really is. Okay, that is the fundamental reality. That's the ultimate reality. And it is, there is no division there. And, and then you become one with it. So now you go for a walk. So now you're being compassionate towards everything, including a dry leaf, right? Compassionate towards everything. If there's um, a creature blocking your way, so as, uh, this happened to me once and I was walking in the ashram um, I had already had my breakfast and I was walking back to my home. So we had finished our morning meditation and um, I had my breakfast and I was walking back. I was walking back on the, on the, uh, on my path. Um, there was a squirrel having its breakfast. So it had found a nut and it was doing very busily, you know, standing, you know, there. <laughs> oh my God, it was so cute. <laughs> it was standing there, squirrel was trying to open it up so it can eat it. You know what I did? I just stopped. I just stopped in my way and I just observed it. I didn't want to disturb it because it's eating his breakfast. How important it was for me to eat my breakfast, right? Especially when I had woken up at five o'clock, the, med the meditation is, is, is at seven o'clock and the breakfast is served only at 7.30 at the ashram. So I've been <laughs> kind of fasting for that long. And I know the value of that breakfast in the morning. I, I enjoyed my breakfast. So wouldn't the squirrel feel the same way? So you wait, you stay there and you, and you watch <laughs> and, you, and you watch. And it took a while. And then, then so, so somebody else was coming from the opposite direction. So she saw me uh, watching the squirrel. So, so she also stopped. And we both were observing the squirrel without disturbing it. And then the squirrel finished its thing. It ran away and then we went our way, you know? So that, that's what I miss. It's just an example, okay? It's not about me or anything. It's just an example. So this is, this is called Vedantic religion. Is it something that we can practice? It's easy to practice, right? It's something that we can do that, not just uh, in the morning or like, you know, if you practice Hindu uh, religion, then you have to do a set of rituals in the morning, especially in the morning. Like uh, you have to get up early finish your, after the ablutions and all that, and you take a shower or whatever. And then before breakfast, you do your uh, rituals. You have to do a bunch of rituals. That's how you would practice it. And then you go about your way. Once your rituals are done, you can eat your breakfast and then you can get your day started. You do whatever you want after that, you know? And then you may do another ritual maybe in the evening. That's how you practice it. But when it comes to Vedantic religion, uh, you practice it all the time. Like I said, when you go for a walk, you can practice it. When you're working, you can practice it. When you work, you you come across other uh, you know people, right? You work with other people, then you you can practice the same thing, nonviolence. <laughs> while while speaking to them, while uh, they speak, while they are speaking to you. Uh, or uh, when you speak to your boss or when the boss is speaking to you, there are so many opportunities when we work to practice Vedantic religion. So in, the, in that speech, in the, in the tone of your voice, you can express your love, you know, then that love comes up, that I, you can express your love in that tone of your voice. And it is contagious. Very soon you will find everybody else around you practicing Vedantic religion because it's very, very contagious, right? Isn't this attitude uh, beautiful? Something that we, we don't think about. And, and what it gives you is the, ultimately it gives you that freedom. 
that uh, vedantic freedom it is a totally different kind of freedom you feel feel that within you you start feeling that the moment you start practicing practicing vedantic religion you will start enjoying that freedom within you know that is the kind of freedom you're talking about now this freedom is for you to keep if you're not accumulating it you're 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 just making it appear within yourself because the mind gets pure right as we as even you practice this vedantic religion or you can call it true religion if you want this true religion if you practice then what you're doing is uncovering that treasure that is within you you see without knowing you will soon have realized it and and you this anxiety anxiety that uh, did i acquire it you'll have this anxiety until only until you have that freedom you know that little anxiety would be there until you get that because you, there's something lacking in you so you have to go do something to to fix that you have to you have this urgency to do something to fix it this is how we get caught in this uh, this wheel you know the samsara chakra the wheel of samsara you see so vedantic religion is very simple it's just you just observe the mind and uh, you when you have these when you're doing these simple activities like walking talking to a person you know or, or preparing a meal oh my god this is something that you can practice while preparing a meal because when you prepare a meal uh, when you if you practice vedantic religion uh, like when you cut your vegetables you say a little prayer because i first what if you're hurting that uh, vegetable you know you're hurting the vegetable when you're cutting it so you at least uh, say a little prayer and then you pray when you do that is there a question okay so when you do that um it is it's not only good for you because th- that food will be ex- extremely uh, nutrition nutritious or potent and it will be it'll help it will not only help you but everybody else who eats that food will feel good because it it affects the food you know the attitude really does affect that food that you prepare so something that you can practice and prepare that is something that we do every day almost every day right preparing food for ourselves or for the family so then you can uh, truly practice that religion no no violence no frustration no anger sometimes we prepare it with anger <laughs> it's not a good a good thing at all if you're angry while preparing the food it's not good at all there's a, they say a story it's a funny story there was a pious uh, man very pious uh, and um, and somebody who would never get angry or never think of stealing anything you know he's a very pious person he went to um a rich man's house because he, he was invited by a rich man so he went to went to this rich man's house and they served him some food in his thing and that's what they had invited him for uh, some from lunch or something so he went there and he had the lunch and uh, and then after he ate uh, his lunch and he went and washed his uh, hands and face and all of that um he had this urge to steal one of the objects in that house so there was something hanging on the wall and he had this in in, in intense urge to, to to possess that thing so when no one was looking he put, picked it up and put it in his pocket and he went home and then he went home and he realized that he had stolen something for the first time in his life he'd never done that before but he'd done it today and so he had to find out the reason why because he uh, read the scriptures uh, he had to go back to the source and and research what had happened so he went there and he returned the object to this rich man he said i'd never done anything like this before in my life but after having eaten at your house uh, i felt like doing it um i want to know what it is that you served me or who it is that who cooked my food today so they um they went and they did an investigation and they found that the cook had uh, uh, collected some ingredients and some of them were stolen from somebody else 
<laughs> so he had stolen the food and, and the, so the greens were stolen. And with that, he prepared the meal. And when he consumed that food, he had this urge to steal, you know? So that's the kind of effect the food will have. That's, it's just a story to tell you that it does affect the food you prepare when you're, when you're angry or the ingredients are not pure, you know? So this is a good time or a good place where we can practice Vedantic meditation, Vedantic religion, okay, or true religion. So, uh, like that, we can look at many examples, any any number of examples we can look at. So, I'm going to stop now and uh, see if you, hi, guys, have any questions. Jyoti, I have a question. Yes, Julia, how are you? Good, thank you. I'm making a sock. Oh, it helps me focus. Stay present. Uh, but my question is, why did you choose to use the word religion? Like, what is the intention behind using the word religion over something maybe less charged, like philosophy or mindset <laughs> or something? Yeah. Well, yeah. The reason I did that is because um, this is more more to do with India, actually. In, in India, they have this uh, religion practiced by the masses. And um, they do, it's not applicable to any of us here in the United States, okay. Um, but uh, it, is, uh, it is practiced in India. And what in the name of religion, the kind of things that they do is appalling. It's totally unacceptable, you know. So what they do is they go to the, uh, the plantain trees, you know, they go where they grow for plantain trees. And then they pick a plantain tree, which has young fruit, very young. You know, if you leave it there within a week or two, it'll it'll become ripe and it'll be edible. But before that, they they cut it, they cut a couple of them, and then they bring it and decorate a temple. Can you believe that? It, I mean, it is this is this is, and this is the name of religion. This is how that religion has, uh, you know, it has gone down and it has become very 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 bad. The way they practice it and in the name of um, religion they light 100,000 lamps 100,000 lamps just imagine the amount of oil that they're uh, wasting and, and how much harm they're uh, bringing to the environment just in the name of religion and nobody can question it if somebody were to question it he would be you know <laughs> beheaded I'm, I'm just kidding but people would be outraged Anything in the name of religion, you cannot question it. But the kind of stuff that they do, like the Ganga, for instance, uh, they put so much flowers in it. But uh, see, when I the first time I went, I think it was 2017, no, 2018. 2018 is the first time I went to Rishikesh. Even then, even that 2018, they were putting a lot of flowers in it. In the name of religion, they would put a lot of flowers in it. You know how dangerous that is? It is. It kills everything. Oh my God! It is. It is the worst thing you can do to put put that into the, because it'll get accumulated somewhere, and it'll drain the water of all the oxygen because this will this will get putri it'll start putrefying. You know, staying there, stagnant. It'll get stagnated somewhere, and then it'll putrefy and it'll uh, get take all the oxygen of that water, and all the creatures in that water is affected by that. And Ganga was becoming filthy, you know, in 2018. But uh, since then, because of uh, the new prime minister, he has a thing called um, Namami Gange. So worship Ganga the right way. Worship Ganga the right way, but not putting anything in it. So now people have stopped. Um, a lot of people who are educated have stopped putting stuff in it. I myself could see the difference when I went in uh, 2020, just uh, you know, last year. Um, in the beginning of the year, people were not putting it. And also, if they do put it, there's a cleanup crew who would come and clean it up. It's so much better now. The water is so much purer. I myself could see the difference in just a couple of years, you know. So this is what I'm talking about. In the name of religion, the kind of stuff that they do. And they do Ganga Harati. In the name of Harati, they take this huge thing, which has many layers and layers of lamps. You know, and, and then they will do the harati around Ganga and the hot oil is falling into the water. You know, it is this is this is what they do and nobody can question them. Nobody can do the government cannot do anything. 
but uh, people are becoming more and more aware of it now, and they're becoming uh, and then and, and then Ganga is getting cleaned up big time, which is a great news, you know. And uh, so this so that's why uh, I think um, Swami Vivekananda coined the term Vedantic religion, it, and then uh, Swami Ramatirtha. Uh, coined the term true religion because you you worship religion right you have to practice a religion it is so important to, to everybody in india especially i don't have to use that term here like you said julia but um, this is important because this is this is the kind of religion you should be practicing don't hurt anything do not cut that plant and tree you know let it grow so that monkeys can eat it or or humans can eat it but so many people start out of dying out of starvation they can eat that if you leave it for a couple more weeks it will become a fruit you know that is edible so that's what i'm talking about that's why this this term is used and uh, our teacher also uses that term and so i chose to use it today that's all and also the topic being vedantic freedom i thought vedantic religion will sound nice <laughs> that's all but if you don't like the term you can drop it all, all the important thing is to practice it whatever it is you practice it so something that we practice is a religion right so therefore uh, that name can be used i thought um but if you want to drop it, but the, the practicing part is okay right julia yeah <laughs> that's what i thought so yeah practicing it's very easy it's extremely easy and your and you feel your mind after that even if you've done a little thing you know like not hurting a leaf not hurting even a single leaf, and then you look at your mind; it'll feel so light and beautiful, and, and wonderful. And that's so. It is. It is uh, very, very useful to practice this on a daily basis. So, any other questions? Yeah, I, I I have a. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Jaganesh. So. What you said about uh, the name and uh, dropping the name when you see a tree is really dropping the recognizing. So it raises another question. How do we raise kids? For instance, just today you showed me a video of our grandniece in Chicago who is like playing with a game uh, and she, she sees the word dog and, you know, she punches dog so do we raise the kids without na uh, names that'll be an interesting word you know well what we do is we raise we teach them names and forms and then uh, they have to undo it when they grow older <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's the way it is you know there, it's a huge uh, effort there <laughs> but we can you know it is important you know, you can't raise the child like a savage right you have to go with the world Initially, it doesn't matter. It's only after a point when you're seeking the freedom. Okay, when you come to a point where you actually seek this inner freedom, you know, the true freedom that you seek, then it's only for people who seek that. But yeah, the people, of course, the name and the form are very, very important. So we teach our children everything. We don't uh, leave behind anything. We teach them everything. We teach them some Vedantic uh, religion also, you know, religious practices. In, rather than you know, rather than teaching them some some rituals and stuff like that, you teach them the right way, you know, to practice uh, Vedantic religion. It is easy. Children pick it up very quickly because they don't need to, uh, uh, you know, recondition themselves or anything like that. They don't, this conditioning is not there to begin with. It's like a, a clean canvas. You can write whatever you want on it. So if the parents are practicing Vedantic religion, the children will pick it up. They will automatically pick it up. But you do, please do go ahead and teach them <laughs> cat and dog and all the names and forms, you know, <laughs> please, they, so they can identify and live in this society. And uh, when, when time comes, they will seek Vedantic freedom. They have brought them up well enough. Even if, well, you, if you don't take that responsibility though to, to yourself, you're not bringing them up. They bring, they bring themselves up. They just grow up, <laughs> you know. You see, one man uh, 
pointed to his garden and said, look at that garden. It's how beautiful it is. I grew it. Did he grow it? <laughs> Did he grow it? Or it, it, because it's nature, he probably provided some or some water or some conducive atmosphere he may have provided. That too, water, where is it coming from? Nature, right? So what, what did he do? Ultimately, if you, if you uh, look at it, ultimately he didn't do anything. You know, so we, we are, we, that's how it is. We just let the children grow up and uh, we do whatever we do, we do, do in the name of duty. That's it. You don't do it in the form of responsibility. Oh, this is my responsibility. Because we're setting ourselves up for a huge disappointment. Because suppose, suppose I take responsibility, then you're had it. Because the child is not, it's going to misbehave. Sooner or later, it might be, you know, it'll misbehave. Then you're the one responsible for its misbehavior, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> So that danger is always there. So res responsible, I am not. Dutiful, I am. I am. I have my duty to perform uh, towards my children, and I will do perform it to the best of my ability. That's it. After that, what happens to that child is up to Bhagawan. So far, Bhagawan has brought the child up. Bhagawan will take care of that child. That's it. And you cannot go get. Uh, you cannot go wrong if you have that attitude. You'll never go wrong. You know, and if you're also practicing Vedantic religion, you're all set. You don't have anything to worry about. Jyoti, I have a question. Yes, Jacqueline, how uh, are you? I, I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, I, when I'm alone and I'm on the land in the country, mm -hmm. I have no problem with doing what you suggest, and that's being aware intensely so making my awareness so intense mm -hmm. and i also feel like at that point when i'm walking around or just you know being in the place outside that something in me opens up mm -hmm. it's like it's there's love going out or something you know it's it's bigger mm -hmm. and then if i have to go to the city and there's all these people around, even when it's not crowded, just there's more people around. And I have to give my attention to all of these different things. It becomes very, very difficult. And then I notice that all of that feeling of openness comes back oh. and closes up mm -hmm. because I can't do it. It's like there's too much. Can you... I don't know. Okay. Give me an idea about that. Absolutely. I, I think I understand why that's happening. So when you're in nature, you're feeling one with it. It is yes. easy to Yeah, you become one with it. And so now there's no division between you and that nature. And so you, you're you okay. You're completely okay with it. And then you see this, you experience this love pouring out. But when you come to a, uh, the city and you're in amidst a lot of people, you don't feel the same way. So you, there's this book called In the Woods of God Realization by Swami Ramatirtha. In that, he, he, he calls humans as woods because this body is compared to a piece of wood. You know, in India, what they do is uh, when, the, when somebody is no more, that body is cremated. And how they do that is take them to take the body to a cremation ground and lay a huge uh, layer of wood, pieces of wood that on, on that uh, body. And then that's how they it's cremated. So the wood burns and the body also burns exactly like that wood. So the, the body is, and even when it is alive, it is compared to wood, you know, like in the forest. So the trees are alive in the forest and you're among, uh, the, among the trees, among the trees, right? And uh, there, are only, there are trees and trees and trees and you're there and you're feeling one with it. Similar, so you look at these humans also as woods. You know, you, you imagine that you're in the middle of the woods, you know, and that way you can feel one with everyone. It is harder to feel one with people than it is to feel one with the nature. You know, I understand that. But it is, is it doable to feel the oneness with people? Yes, it is. 
It's just a matter of uh, keeping with it, you know, and practicing it. Now, one other person, or maybe two. Yes. A, a group of three. But when it's people I don't know, and there's a bunch of them, it's just like, I just shut down. Okay. So I stay home. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But if you, you're in the right track, if you keep practicing, you'll be able to do it with more and more people and with everybody, you know, you'll be able to do it. So you're on the right track. <laughs> Any other questions? I have five more minutes. <laughs> yes, I have, a, well, it kind of combines with what Manoj and then Jacqueline, it, he, Manoj mentioned about letting, dropping the identification of leaves, branches, when you see a tree and just see it, don't even name it, okay? Mm -hmm. And Jacqueline was talking about that with people. So it occurred to me, maybe is it part of this, like whether you're encountering an individual, another individual or a group of people, if you do the same thing where you drop any identification or um, words for, oh, that person looks like this or acts like that or sounds like that or oh, wearing a different color or, you know, that kind of thing where you drop all that stuff. Is that so? Yes. But yeah, it's a very similar thing as we as you would do in the in the nature. You know, you drop all the namas and rupas, means names and forms. Mm -hmm. Start Stop naming these as people other than myself, right? Or even looking at starting to go to that point where you start picking up on, oh, that dropping even the feeling of, oh, that person's energy is kind of weird or, or something, <laughs> or yeah. I don't feel right around that. You drop that too. Exactly. Yeah. All of those feelings are dropped also. Okay. And continuing on what uh, Julia shared, uh, you know, uh, I, I've personally noticed it uh, with a lot of fellow practitioners, you become more and more uh, sort of introverted. You know, you don't seek mm -hmm. big parties, gatherings uh, right. in the journey. You become quieter. Yeah, you know? well, we weren't talking about people talking. We're just talking about people present. They're yeah. not talking, right? But in a party, it's, it's that is a different situation. We can discuss that also. Um, I mean, the desire for small talk sort of goes away more and more, you know, mm -hmm. just passing the time, talking for the sake of talking, you know, the humanness, you know. Yeah, yeah parties uh, we can avoid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we want the, the Jacqueline Dust is the right thing, you know, stay away from parties. <laughs> and we can avoid because there'll be... A lot of, uh, like Manoj was saying, uh, small talk and stuff, which is not really of any use, really, you know, because if there are two people with two different opinions, exactly opposite. Uh, the, the, the end of the party, if you notice, this person is repeating what he said in the beginning of the party, and this person is repeating what he said in the beginning of the party. They wouldn't have accomplished anything by, you know, speaking their mind. So those kinds of things would happen. Two hours you would have spent without... Any, any, uh, anything, anything that's accomplished at the end of it. Nothing is accomplished at the end of it. You know, so that kind of talk we can avoid. We should avoid. You should never engage in that kind of conversations. So that is uh, that is okay. But uh, we're talking about being around people who are not talking. We're just being around a lot of people. Um, then you can mingle with them the way you would in the in the nature uh, in, in, where there's a bunch of trees. You see, that's what we're talking about. That I is like I like the idea of seeing a, a bunch of people in the street that I'm walking with as other trees. Exactly, I'll be able to do that. Yes. <laughs> Chochi, that's um, the way to go. <laughs> you, you were talking about yes. parties. What's your What are your thoughts about like? family gatherings around holidays, like being with people, because you can have a situation there too, where you have people with different ideas that might want to clash a little bit and stuff. Yeah. It's the same. I mean, you know, we don't, we're not 
discriminating family and non-family here. <laughs> it's the same thing. So, I mean, you can remain silent and be an observer, you know, if you find yourself in a situation like that. You can choose not to not to mingle. I mean, you, you can be among them, but not. you can be silent and be, be observant. That we can do, right? I do. <laughs> Sometimes I do that. You know, when I just remain quiet. Unless it is something uh, where you're sharing your ideas is going to help somebody, you know, then yeah, then speak up. Of course, there's no no problem with that. But uh, if no, nothing is going to come out of it, suppose your your th- thinking is way different, you're at a totally different wavelength, you know, <laughs> then uh, what is the point? You're not going to be able to convince anybody. And the idea is not to convince anybody. They have to feel and they have to want it. Then it, then they can go, they can have it. Otherwise, what is the point? You cannot convert anybody, you know. And that's not the point. That's not our goal, also. So we can remain silent. That would be uh, that would. I mean, we should not find ourselves in situations like that. If we can avoid it, that's the first choice. But if you do find yourself in situations like that, then this would be a good uh, thing to do. Remain silent. <laughs> else? I mean, I could empathize with uh, Julia Baker. Uh, let, let's call her the other Julia. Um, I mean, the, the word uh, religion, uh, it also, uh, you know, that's part of my conditioning. Growing up in India, rebelling against the Hindu establishment uh, practices, uh, why didn't Swamiji label it as uh, spirituality than religion? You know? but the word religion brings back, uh, you know, I mean, the whole reason, let's face it, uh, I think almost all of us here have uh, rebelled against uh, mainstream religion. Well, the name, and doing what we're the doing name now. was coined by Swami Vivekananda and uh, also Swami Ramatirtha true religion by one of them and uh, Vedantic religion by the other. And Swami, our Swamiji, my teacher, he uses that. I already explained it, but uh, I can. I don't mind saying it again. He uses that because there's a certain religion being practiced in India today, and he's trying to replace that religion with this religion. So, to, so to, in order to give them a replacement, he's using the term religion. That's the only reason. Ultimately, what is important is to practice it rather than focus on the name, you know. Practicing it is more important. And it is easy. It's very easy. And uh, the result is unbelievable, you know. It is, you cannot put a price on it. What you get is freedom. Uh, to uncover this freedom with, within. And that will give you all the other freedom. Uh, you will feel financially free. No matter how much money you have, you'll feel you'll get that freedom. Yeah, you'll be able to live within your means, you know, and uh, everything that is necessary, that will be taken care of. And uh, and that is, that's a given. It will be taken care of. It's guaranteed. So that's how Swamis live, you know. Swami so TV, for instance. Uh, he has given up everything. He doesn't have a single penny to his name. But every uh, he flies uh, business class to India. Wow, it just gets done. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, in, in, in light of the pandemic, this is a very appropriate uh, concept. Uh, people feel trapped in many ways, you know, because of what's going on. How would you say this notion of freedom uh, applies? Because there's a yearning to just kind of, you know, we talked about being uh, not social, but the pandemic has taken away the human uh, interactions at the same time. Yeah, this is this has given us an opportunity to learn some very important lessons. First of all, that nothing is in our control. You know, we think that we are in charge, that it's because of me that all of this is... Uh, sometimes I feel that it's because of me that this whole planet is going around. <laughs> and that kind of a feeling, you know, sometimes some people feel that way, right? They think that they have everything under control. 
they have these strings that they pull with family members and, and uh, so everything is under their control but suddenly the pandemic strikes and now they now nothing now they know you know that nothing is really in our control that's the most important lesson we learned from this and we learn to let go and surrender and we uh, we uh, don't look at time anymore we stop looking at the time when is this going to end we, we don't we don't look at that anymore because the higher power will decide when it is going to end uh is it going to get worse before it becomes gets better a higher power will decide or uh, you know everything is under that higher power's uh, control and my oncologist knows that you know um because he gives the treatment the same treatment pretty much the same treatment to everybody right so so they determine what kind of cancer it is first of all and then depending on what kind what organ it uh, originated from they have a certain protocol you know they follow the same thing for all the patients and the treatment works for some people it works really good in some some people it doesn't it kind of works for some people it does not work at all for some other people why how they cannot just nobody can explain it and so my oncologist never plays god you know he never ever not even for a moment he plays you know things that he's god that god complex is not there with him because he knows if it works it's like oh what it's a miracle he would say that's how he told me he looked at my thing and he said this is this is a miracle he never expected it I, my shape i was in such a bad shape according to how he looked at it my condition was in very 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 bad shape so <laughs> he did he never thought that that it, it, it this would this kind of a result uh, would would come out of it what kind of result is uh, is that it's you know chemotherapy cleared up most of the tumor most of it is gone except two spots are not responding to chemotherapy so what he has done is he's referred me to a, a radiologist and that radiologist is going to take care of those two spots this is how i stand you know so they can still not call it a cure only only if they have done a surgery they can call it a cure they won't call it a cure other, otherwise but uh, i would be cancer free for the moment and then i can be cancer free for for months or years or maybe only weeks nobody nobody knows he that like, can not tell so they're not, they won't call it a cure they'll just say it is in partial remission that's what they call it or maybe even remission i don't know so um and the the last meeting i had he said you are a miraculous person <laughs> you know <laughs> so it's, so this is a miraculous situation you are a miraculous person he said and i'm like oh i i don't know about that you know i have i have no idea i didn't do anything all i did was accept my condition that's it which which made it easy for me that's all nothing else you know suppose i hadn't accepted it then what would have happened you know because i had accepted it then uh, there would be so much resistance coming from within and so much sadness you know sadness would have been felt that is the first thing you would feel when you resist because this question why me you know why is this happening to me i took such good care of myself you know i never did anything wrong i exercised every day I did yoga for an hour every day <laughs> you know and and uh, i mean i ate very carefully uh it's small portions you know just enough to fill up the stomach that's it and then it happened so why me why me this question would have been there and there would have been a lot of sadness and that sadness would have weighed my mind down my and i would have felt it in my body too and you know what that would have hurt the healing process that ultimately that's what it would have done i wouldn't have helped myself one wee bit by um resisting it so i said i accept because uh, god will give us only that which we can uh, handle he will not god will not give us anything that is that we cannot handle so you we uh, the moment we accept it 
the mind feels so light. Oh my God. The mind is a mind which accepts whatever happens, it accepts. An accepting mind is the lightest mind there is. And to, and to have a light mind is, is a boon, it's a blessing, such a blessing. So acceptance, we need to practice. So in, in, that's what we learn, you know, from this, from an experience like this. We, we need a tough experience like this to be able to really practice this true religion. I know you guys, <laughs> some of you don't like the word religion, but, uh, but to be able to practice it, you know, um, this is this is this would be the perfect time to practice it. So it is an opportunity. You have to see it as an opportunity rather than anything else. And it is possible. It's doable. And ultimately, you're the one who's going to enjoy that free mind, that light mind. You know, you experience Vedantic freedom. Okay, we've gone over time today, so we'll stop here and we'll meet again sometime in the future. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Pur namidam, pur nad, pur namudachyate, pur nasya pur namadaya pur nameva vashishyate, Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyonamha Hari Om Sat Sri Krishna Pranamastu